Hello everybody and welcome to today's video where we're gonna talk about Zenith. Okay, so in case you haven't heard of this book yet so far in life, where have you been? This got tremendously horrible reviews when it got out on the market. There was a little bit of an argument whether Sasha Alsberg got published because she's a naturally gifted writer or if it's because she has a tremendously big following online. I do want to address that and say that I was very much prepared to love this book. If you've been on my channel for a little bit, you know that sci-fi is pretty much the majority of what I ever read. I absolutely adore sci-fi and the premise of this book sounded so promising to me. It's essentially about a space criminal called the Bloody Baroness who floats through space in a scavenger ship called the Marauder and has an all-female crew of female vagabonds and they're being chased by a bounty hunter. <sighs> I need a breath. It sounded like it was gonna be such a nice little holiday sci-fi. So the point of me saying that was I do know about the reviews that are out there but I was prepared to just think it's people being jealous, it's people not understanding, not wanting to understand, not really giving this a try and I was wrong. This is gonna be a review of the first 79 pages of this because that's pretty much as much as I could endure out of this book. There's so many tabs, look at this circus. Are you guys ready? This is what the tabs mean. Yellows are we don't know what this means. The pinks are general nonsense. The greens are weird ass traits. And the oranges are super vague history. <laughs> so this is what we're working with here today. So I just want you to very click quickly, sure Megan. I just want you to very quickly brace yourself because this is gonna be a salty ass video. <laughs> right, so on the first page here, I've marked some general issues with the book that I wanted to outline. My first issue is that we're in space, okay? We're set, this entire book is in different galaxies across the universe. Why is everything humanoid? Your only limitation to what things are and can be is your own imagination. And I was so let down with the stuff that was described and the characters that came in. There's been space crews, there's been police troops crews, nothing. It's all humanoid, but with really weird nonsensical traits to them that have been thrown just to make the characters look weird and funky and unique. So I just want to clarify that. That annoyed me because you have unlimited possibilities, literally, and you still went for human. Uh, next up, I have the perspectives in this book. So far, uh, again, all of this is up until page 80 uh, because that's as far as I could endure. We have so far one, two, three, four, five perspectives and it's the first 80 pages. Now I can give you an example of a book where perspectives have been done very successfully. Books like Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo and Crooked Kingdom by Lee Bardugo. You get to spend a sufficient time with a certain character in order to understand their history, their motivation, their emotions, their character. And it's not rushed. It's not something that you rush to get through just to get it out the way and say that you've done it. But in this book, you genuinely feel like every single perspective is thrown in together. It doesn't really give you much. It sort of gives you these really, really vague clues and really vague ideas that do more to confuse you rather than make you identify with a character. Throughout these first 80 pages, even though we had five characters who we were in the perspective of, I still couldn't identify with any of them because I just didn't understand them. Um, so that was my issue with the points of view there. I have marked some of them to go through in a second with you. So the moral question that we have with Androma is the fact that she doesn't want to be the bloody baroness. And even though on the very first page of her story, we learned that she's riddled by these nightmares of dead people and the murders that she's done and it's all tearing her apart inside in her ethical bone. Throughout the book, in the next 40 pages, it's consistently proven otherwise. Even though she's tormented so much morally by all of the killing she's doing, she continues to take it on willingly. Like there are jobs that she could be taking scavenging which do not include murder, but she does take them Anyway, an example, page 45. Somebody has just penetrated her ship, so there's troopers storming in. She hurtled her way through the first wave of patrolmen before they could blink, lashing out her swords, removing smoking limbs from bodies as they screamed and succumbed to the trademark agony of the bloody baroness. Trademark 
agony. I know that sounds cool to say, but like, it doesn't fit with the description that you've already given this character. Page 47! Take care of him, she said as the bullet clattered to the floor. Breck was suddenly beside her, twisting the man's neck with a glorious pop, music to Andy's ears. Why is it music to Andy's ears if she's so tortured and has nightmares about killing people? See, these are the kind of things that there's just a lot of little inconsistencies that go against each other and at a certain point it just becomes like so unreliable to read this because it could turn at any second, okay? So let's start going through these, shall we? Uh, let's start, I think, with the pink ones because they're the ones that are miscellaneous and then we can get into the stuff that's really targeted here. Right, so one of the things that annoyed me was repetition. There was a lot of repetition throughout this book of certain names of certain words of certain cursings so on this page this is page 32 uh we're in dax's point of view he is the bounty hunter who's hunting the marauder and the first sentence here says they'd never catch the marauder not like this and four sentences down it says he stared out the viewport past the laughable pilot and the co-pilot their heads pressed together as they tried in vain to discover a way to outsmart their prey and then on a separate line on its own he just specifies the Marauder. We know, we know it's the Marauder because you've just mentioned it like a second ago. So it's fine, like we know, we know exactly what you mean. You don't have to repeat yourself, like we're not idiots, we're keeping track. So one of the pilots tells him they're making an interesting move and Dex says, what move? Use your words. The kid up until this point hasn't proven anything to warrant this kind of response. Use your words. He started a conversation with you. He's the one who's talking first. Again, I know it's a cool sentence and you needed somebody to say it so that it looks badass, but it doesn't make sense in this context. Okay, moving on. Next page, 33. You, he said, glaring at the youngling between his fingers, will do yourself a favor and go to the passenger bay so you can crap your pants in private. I can smell your fear from here. What is this whole sentence? I don't understand. Go to the passenger bay so you can crap your pants in private? First of all, that's such a nonsensical way to tell somebody to just take a break. Like, go in the back, you're dismissed. Here's like three more ways to say that without saying, oh, I need to go crap your pants in private. That's literally something you hear in like middle school between children. Generally, the feeling of this book is like a... 12 year olds fan fiction of their favorite sci-fi and not an actual sci-fi um okay so this is page 40 this is another general nonsense scene so they've just been attacked and lyra who's operating the ship she's the pilot she tells andy oh andy they shoot everything down andy then responds everybody go to the pods and lyra says we can't leave andy when the ship goes dark the pods go dark too like like, yeah, like, of course they do. They're a part of the ship. She's just told you they shut everything down. Next up, page 42. The sentence starts off on 41. She was the captain of the Marauder, the greatest ship in Mirabelle, and she had a crew waiting on her word. Let's just focus on the greatest ship in Mirabelle. So we've only known this ship for about 40 pages. It's already ran out of fuel. It's been penetrated forcefully by a policeman fleet. And it's been shut down completely by another vehicle. So definitely the greatest ship in uh, Mirabelle. Got that nailed. Next on page 67, Dex cursed inwardly. How? You can curse quietly and you can curse under your breath, but cursing inwardly is fucking impossible. Anyhow, he should have known better than to scheme with the general of Arcadius. Next page. We had a deal, Dex said through gritted teeth, and the deal will still be honored. The terms have simply been, the general waved a hand as if dismissing their old agreement, extended. Back to previous page here. He should have known better than to scheme with the general of Arcadius. She's just done a deal with the general of Arcadius. Why are you cursing him for being dumb enough to trust this guy when you've just done a deal to work for the same guy? <laughs> Again, I was so prepared to love this book. I don't know what happened. Actually, I do know what happened. It's this, this happened. Now, this is a description on 72 of Lyra, um, who Andromache calls Lyra because 
one letter obviously makes the name much more bearable to speak. So Lyra is described as this scaly woman. We're gonna get to that in a second. She didn't believe in killing didn't believe in taking lives senselessly and sending the souls onto their next lives. She's on a scavenging ship. They've been killing people like madmen. This is too little too late. <laughs> Anyhow, last pink tab guys. This is about her powers. It says that they're useless. I want you to keep that in mind. Ready to move on? So am I. The next, tab the next tabs are gonna be the weird ass traits. This is page 13. The Marauder, a glimmering starship made from the rare, impenetrable glass beryllium. Imagine this, it's a starship made out of glass. Does this make sense? Not to me, it don't. Like, yeah, I'd understand it if the ship was made of reflective surface, if it was um, impenetrable window panes, but glass, it just implies that the whole thing's just made out of like glass glass. Do you remember page like, I don't know, 50 when the impenetrable glass got penetrated? Yeah, me too. And actually, wait for this ladies and gentlemen. So just remember what I've just said, page 50, they passed several doors before stopping at the glass door that led to the meeting room. Naturally assuming that the entire ship is made of glass, so why not just use the same fucking glass everywhere? Dex smiled back, lifted his gun and shot through the glass. If this was the same kind of glass that the rest of your ship is made out of, it just got shot with a bullet and it shattered! This is a description of Lyra, who is the pilot. Uh, when she experienced strong emotions, the scale began to glow. She has scales, by the way, just, meant, just mentioned. Giving off enough heat to burn through the flesh of her enemies, occasionally rendering Lyra unconscious when activated. So how is that a useful weapon? How, how does that make her a machine? You can't, you can't fight too many villains unconscious, you know, so. Pointing that out. This is about her powers. It says that they're useless. I want you to keep that in mind. Uh, this is page 32. The Marauder is described as deadly and delicious. Not even gonna comment on that. Moving on. Page 33. The boy tripped over his own webbed feet as he raced from Dex's view. Why does he have webbed feet? Nobody fucking knows. It's one of those descriptions that is thrown in there to sound cool, but it's also like not important to the story whatsoever, so why the fuck do we know? Page 49. This is another man with a fucking weird description. The burly horned man. He glared at her with red and white striped eyes. Red and, red and white striped eyes. Okay. Page 67. <laughs> The general smiled like a Salerian ice wolf. I'm just gonna ask the question that all of us are asking. What the fuck is a Salerian ice wolf? Okay, page 69. Dex Ares stared deep into Andy's moonlit eyes. Which moon? How convenient that wherever you the fuck are, it's the moonshine that's shining into her eyes and not a billion stars across the fucking universe. But it sounds romantic, so just chuck it in. The next color is yellow and this means stuff that we don't know what it means. Uh, so first yellow here on page 16. Breck, who is one of the crew members, ex uh, says with a sigh, Adherence, which is a nation of people. Lyra is an adherent. This doesn't imply anything to us because we don't know what adherents are like because we have no context. Like, what does this describe Lyra as? Adherents. What, what, stubborn? Rash? I don't know. Nobody knows. Page 17. Gee, right next door. The wind blew as hot as the devil's backside. How hot is the devil's backside? Somebody tell me because I haven't done any fucking research. Nonsense. This is a nonsensical simile. Okay, so page 21. On a good day, the marauder and her crew could lose a tail as fast as an adherent Darawak could fly. What's an adherent Darawak? Because we don't fucking know. We don't have a context for the simile, so we have no clue how fast that is. On page 22, we have activated the marauder's outer shields. Why? It's made of impenetrable class who the fuck knows without the cloaking system we're flying loose as a uh, 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 i'm assuming this is where another weird ass simile would go lyra stopped her with a grin this is where they're running from the police so they need to cover up i wasn't talking about cloaking and that's where we stopped we don't know what the fuck cloaking is 
We don't know what she's implying here. If there's another defense system, we don't know because it doesn't get explained until like the next page. Um, on the next page, by the way, 27. I don't know if you can see here. I've crossed out a couple of sentences because they should never have existed. You always did know how to make a girl blush. Lyra grinned, her sharp canines flashing at the red lights of the prox alarm. You should see the last chip I piloted. It's hard to put so many cliched lines in one piece of dialogue. Page 28, oh, and 29, actually, this is a whole, this is one chapter here. This chapter means absolutely nothing to anybody. It's, we have no context for this. We have no link to the rest of the story whatsoever. We don't know how much we need to care about this. We don't know what it's talking about. It's absolutely unnecessary at this point to have it. Page 32, my days. Here I am, the ship seemed to say, large and in charge, and as undercover as a Zempteran carriage slug. What's a Zempteran carriage slug, everybody asks. Nobody the fuck knows. Nobody. Great, moving on. This is page 55. You're the one behind all of this, and he asks, Imagine her sitting on a table, she has Dex on one side, the general on the other, she's talking to the general. And she's very surprised that he's behind this whole scheme to find her and bring her to authority. Uh, she killed his daughter. Like, really? That shocking? Really? Page 70! We're talking about chewing gum here, so brace yourselves. A wad of expired moon chew though bitter as a cold Salirin night. Okay, so just in case you weren't convinced as to how much the similes and these make no sense, she's just compared a piece of gum to the night. The bitter that you can use for gum and the bitter that you use for night and atmosphere are two different bitters, babe. They, they mean different things. Throwing that out there. Page 72, this continues. Lyra is talking about her mother and the lessons that she's taught her. Peace, stretching as deep as the roots of the trees of Aramea, as tall as the mountain of Rymor. What the fuck is the mountain of Rymor? And how long are the roots of the trees of Aramea? What is the tree of Aramea? I don't fucking know. Nobody fucking knows. We don't know how to visualize or conceptualize this shit. There's only one thing that I've marked as I liked this. Page 77, well, page 76, we're introduced to an AI. Yes, I love the concept of the AI. He's sort of a glass robot with mechanical innards. He looks awesome. His name is Alfie. Alfie. An artificial life form intelligence emissary. Version 7.3. They couldn't come up with the necessary terms, but they wanted to name him Alfie anyway, so they just like went for it, like why not? And lastly, Thank God we only have the orange tabs left. So the orange, in case you couldn't remember, is super vague history. Like throughout this, we're just given super ambiguous hints as to what history might be like, but like we don't actually get given anything. So it ends up being confusing and you don't know how to put pieces together because they don't match together. So the first one that I can find is here. This is a whole paragraph that I've just circled because this is about Lyra's scales. You remember her scales that make her a deadly weapon that is also unconscious? Those ones. Her scales were a trait many from her home planet desired, but few have. Lyra's bloodline traced back to the first adherents who colonized the terraformed world. Soon after the colonization, the planet experienced a radioactive event that transformed its earliest settlers into a number of strange ways, including the scales Lyra had inherited. So, what's this world? What, what radioactive event? What other mutations do we have? Can you see how this is a paragraph of history that doesn't really give us any history at all? Page 17, we're talking about Androma, and there's a sentence here that says, she stared at her blades once more before putting them back in their harness. If only she could put her memories away just as easily. Uh, we don't know what her memories are. We don't know how traumatic they are. This sentence means absolutely nothing to us because doesn't progress the story, doesn't give us tension, it's just sort of annoying that it's there because we don't know what the fuck it means. Uh, page 45, we're talking about Dex here and Androma and their history. Gone was the young woman he'd once known, that shivering thing he'd found bruised and broken in the markets of Ulvika. 
You see how this is a piece of something that doesn't fit anywhere? The, it, it might as well not be there. Like, we don't know anything about her past besides the fact that she's killed a bunch of people, so I don't... It puts you nowhere in her timeline. We still don't know what her timeline looks like, so this kind of thing... We're told it, we don't know where to put it, whether it relates to anything, it's just there. Page 55. The Academy, where she and thousands of other military students had trained. It was also the place where she learned to dance. So one piece of history there, which obviously we can place, she's young, she's a student, she's going to the academy. Why I've marked this is the fact that the military academy also has ballet lessons. Again, I know it sounds cool to say, but you can't just ram all of the cool things together because then they become shitty nonsense. Two months ago, one of our satellites picked up a signal from Zen Petra's prison moon, Lunamir. I've marked this again, because I like it. Hooray. There's three things about this book that I finally like. It ties to the very first chapter. So we're sort of getting an idea of where the plot is gonna go, which is great. Another chapter from the point of view of Claren. We still don't know anything about Claren. We still don't know why she's important. We still don't know where she is, what she is, if she connects to our story whatsoever. And lastly, page 71. A man leading her to escape and take up a life on the run. A bastard who could barely call himself a Tenebran guardian after everything he'd done. She was glad he'd lost his title and his ship that night. Um, what is everything that he's done? What the fuck is a Tenebrian guardian? How does he relate to any of this? Why are they escaping? This gives us more questions than actual answers. And it's questions that we didn't even need to have. I can't. I've read 80 pages and I'm not reading anymore, for the love of God. I'm sending this to my friend, she has an interest in reading it, I'm not keeping it in my library. I genuinely tried! This is what's frustrating to me. I wanted to love this book, I wanted to love the plot. And then these little stupid things sort of just poke holes in you. Like, it, you, at the first 20 pages it's cute because it's like, oh okay, I see how it is. It's a holiday type of sci-fi, fine, it's easy to go through, not much thought. And then literally, the more you go through it, the more it becomes annoying as hell. Because it feels like nobody's actually thought about these little things. They've just put things there because they're cute and they sound cool. But nobody's thought about the actual plot and how they actually fit in the genre. Or, I don't know, I was really disappointed. And I, I know I'm not the only one. But, ugh, I hope this wasn't too salty. I swore a lot. I'm sorry. It just, it was well earned. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please check out some of my other videos, which are most likely on the side of your screen, or if you're in cinema mode, just down below. I promise they're not as salty as this one. This was just like a once in a in a year type of saltiness here. And if you like those as well, free, free to subscribe to my channel as that lets me know that people support this book blog and that feels really, really nice. And from then on, stay awesome, keep being cool and continue reading. Bye!